me I try to get into this business of compactness today with little thing. So, let us recall our various things that we have had so far. Okay. So, first given any metric space we have many concepts now. One is the notion of open sets, which is the basic uh, building block of the so called topological ideas. Then on the other side of the closed side, the flip side of the open sets. Then we had the notion of uh, sequences. Okay, so these are some kind of convergence related notions. We had the notion of bounded sets okay. so these are at least uh, acceptability I have brought everything uh, in this. So, we have this open sets, we have this closed sets, sequences, convergence, boundedness, total boundedness. So, and uh, some of the, the two important theorems that we got from real line and which finally said how we generalize to the uh, spaces which gave us the notion of total boundedness are the two basic theorems called the bolzano weierstrass and the Cantor's intersection property. So, one the Bolzano-Weierstrass theorem which said that every totally bounded now in a metric space we are going to talk about. So, here it in a complete metric space has a limit point. So, it is sort of using these ideas of level 2 and 3 convergence notions, uh, sequences and total boundedness. Okay. And the second property we had which is actually a consequence of this is the Cantor's intersection problem. which will come into play a little later, but I will state it. This brings in the closed sets, properties of the closed sets. Okay. So, therefore, would have got this, would have had something to do with this and something this theorem deals with those things. Okay. What does that say? If f n is a sequence of non empty closed totally bounded sets in a complete metric space Then or equal to f n that is is non increasing then
if the diameter of this x goes to 0, then the intersection is not only non empty, is a singleton. set contains exactly one point. So, this links for example, closed sets, completeness okay, and totally bounded. So, the interplay between all these fellows and we keep bringing in this completeness because we are modeling on the real line, on the real numbers which is complete. Therefore, we are borrowing properties from the real numbers which fall off from the fundamental property of the completeness of the real and then borrowing this completeness statements. Now, I have not proved these two things, may be time permitting I the proof we did, but anyway if time permits I will come back to this proof in the end. Now, what I will do is, so far we introduced the notion of open sets, but uh, we left them in the lurch, we would really, okay. Now, I will with the notion that the open sets are building blocks, okay. So, suppose x rho is a metric space. and G is any collection is a collection. So, G is a collection of open sets in this metric space such that you can build a whole space with this. That is what does that mean? Build means the only thing I can do with sets is union or intersection basically. If I am doing u intersection, I am going down, I am not building much. So, I have to take the, so what I will do basically that I can build the whole set x by using all these g elements. That is I will put it as union of all the sets g such that g belongs to this collection. If it and take their union definitely this is part of G because every G is in uh, this metric space they are all open sets in the metric space. So, their union will be there, but what this says is the union is exactly equal. What does that mean? That is for every x in x there is at least 1 g in this collection of open sets such that x must belong to x must be in the union. So, at least it should belong to you take an element it should be in one of the members of the union at least one of the members of the union. So, if you have such a collection of open sets then we say g is an open cover, it covers the whole set, open cover for x rho, right. Means I can build the whole metric space using this open sets, the entire metric space can be built up using this just this open sets. So, in other words small pieces put together will give me the whole space, these are the small pieces and the small pieces are all alike, they are all open sets. So, again it is like most people know linear algebra, this is a common statement made by many of my colleagues, most people know linear algebra, it is a very paradoxical uh, statement. Uh, people think they know linear algebra. That's a more correct. I think I made you a statement once. I don't know whether I made it here or not. 
the value of an individual is a ratio. The numerator is what he knows, the denominator is what he thinks he knows and the denominator increasing the value goes on decreasing. Okay. So, therefore, uh, let us say that we all have some idea about linear algebra instead of saying that we all know linear algebra, let us say we all have some idea about linear algebra. So, one of the fundamental things the universe in which we work in linear algebra is that of a vector space. Right? What are the basic ingredients of a vector space? The vectors. Okay. Now, similarly, the basic ingredients of the metric space are these open sets. We look at these basic ingredients. Okay. Now, we would like to extract some vectors out of it through which we can build the whole space. Building in the vector space means you are allowed to do whatever you are allowed to do in a vector space. And the only thing that we are allowed to do in a vector space is add or scale or multiply which is boils down to taking linear combination. So, therefore, there we look for a collection of sets, a vectors which build the whole space and that is called a spanning set. If, if a collection of sets vectors in a vector space do that, we call that a spanning set. Counterpart of that, this open cover is a collection of these basic ingredients which build the whole space. Now, here building we have only sets, the only building process is the union that we think of. Okay. So, therefore, this idea of covering is a counterpart of the notion of a spanning set in a vector space. Now, we may have too many vectors in a vector space, a lot of redundant vectors also in the in a spanning set. So, sometimes if you have a spanning set, a smaller subset may also be a spanning set. Okay. Similarly, here when I have an open cover, a small section of same set, maybe unnecessary things are also there or too many redundant things are there, maybe a smaller collection G1 which is contained in G is also an open cover. In that case, that is called a sub cover. Okay. Just like a sub spanning set, it is a sub G1 is a small sub collection of G is such that G 1 is also an open cover for X, then G 1 is called a sub cover from G. You have selected a sub cover from G. Okay. Is that clear? So, we have these vector spaces, the counterpart is we have this spanning set. So, okay, vectors we And then we add these spanning sets, we have the ponding notion here as open cover and then here are subsets, sub spanning sets, we have this sub cover. Okay. So, now this sub this spanning sets that we had in a vector space are like sampling sets. If you just go and look at what is happening there, you really practically can find out what is happening elsewhere in the vector space. Now, therefore, you know what is happening in these open sets. 
then I know what is happening. So, these open sets are like small neighborhoods in the country. If you go and see how is the economic situation in all these places, we will know what is happening in the country. Okay. But of course, most of the time you do not have to look too many places, one place will give you. So, it is not like cook a pot of rice, you will have to check, you do not have to check every rice to see whether it is cooked or not, one rice will do. So, a very fantastic uh, spanning set, it, uh, sampling set it has, but whereas here we may have to do many places go and see what is happening. Okay. Now, whenever we are, we are doing sampling, we would like to make our sampling set as small as possible. And that is what leads to the notion of a basis. And we would like if that could be made finite. In that case, we get a finite dimensional vector space. What happens in a finite dimensional vector space? No matter what spanning set you give, however big a spanning set you give, I can extract a finite linearly independent set which spans the whole space. So, in other words, no matter what spanning set you give, there is a finite sub spanning set which is covering the whole space and that is the concept we would like to borrow and that gives you the notion of compactness. Okay. So, yeah, so, we have this finite dimensional vector space and the corresponding notion is ideas are the same, only the building are different, the building are different, but then the notion of building is the same. Okay. So, metric space, this is the definition. A metric space x rho The vector space V is said to be finite dimensional vector space, a metric said to be compact, I just write it in that. If whatever open cover you give, there is a finite sub cover. If finite that is what is meant by compactness. So, that notion emerges from now these building blocks open set. So, we have now looked at various aspects of it. Now, we are going to pursue compactness for a while and see what is the connection with all these fellows. We have this notion of open sets, we have this notion of closed sets, we have the notion of uh, uh, completeness, we have the notion of total boundedness, we have the notion of sequence and uh, now we have the notion of compactness. What is the relation? Actually, when you are working in a uh, very well work in a general topological space, there is a very, very uh, could be different idea. But in a metric space, there is a coherent connection all these fellows. Okay. Look at uh, this uh, notion of compactness is a little bit uh, now. Okay. I will come to examples a little later, but I hope the idea is clear. Okay. The house, uh, these open sets are like blocks. Try to put these blocks together so that you get the whole space. Okay. It is like trying to fill up a square with disks. See, suppose you had uh, uh, only open balls, not open set. Problem is different. If you take now our uh, take uh, this rectangle as our metric space, 
with the usual metric. So, open balls will be circles. Now, if I give a number of circles which cover the whole rectangle, try to fill it up with finite number of them, we may have problems or we may not have problems. How do you cover up this? Do we have the boundary in it? We do not have the boundary in it. All sort of confusion will come into the picture, but we give the freedom not only open sets, you can also think of not only open balls, we can think of open sets. It is not much because every open set is made up of open balls because around every point there is an open ball. So, every set is also made up of open ball, open ball. So, but therefore, we look at a general open set and then see what is the connection between all this and then we look at some examples. I will keep these two not uh, proved this. So, so, now we have this notion of compactness. Okay. When open cover, the notion of sub cover and the notion of compactness. See the definition of compactness every open cover must have a finite cover, it is not necessary that I produced one. See remember when I talked about totally bounded set, what did I say? For any radius r, I have some finite number of open balls which cover that, but here it is not like that. You give me whichever open cover you like, from that I will extract finite number. Okay. So, you have the choice to give your infinite thing but I will extract finite from that. Okay. So, I have on the one hand this notion of compactness and on the one hand I have sequences and convergence. On the, on the one hand I have the notion of this total boundedness. I am going to connect all these. There is a connection between all these fellows. So, this connection is what is important because in metric spaces it makes us life easy that we will look at compactness, point of view of open covers whenever it is convenient, from the point of view of total boundedness whenever it is convenient, from the point of view of sequential things whenever it is convenient. Okay. So, different problems require using the notion of compactness in different perspectives. It is the same thing we are looking at in, in metric cases, the same thing will be looked at uh, different angles. So, what I do is, suppose I take a compact metric. Oh, okay. Let me make a few comments before that. Now, suppose I have a metric space x rho and I have a set S which is a subset of x. Okay. Now, whenever you have a subset of metric space, that itself becomes a metric space with the same metric because the same distance can be used only in a smaller collection. Then S rho. is itself a metric space. Okay. Now, look at only this metric space. How do open sets look like in this metric? First of all, open sets uses the notion of open balls, every point must have a open ball around it which is in that set. So, therefore, we should first look at how do open balls look like in this metric space. So, therefore, how an open ball of radius r 
the point center S where S is a point in S row look like in S row in this metric space in any metric open ball what open ball means. So, now we should define this as B R S how does what is the definition it looks at all the x's in web s in that set which are within a distance of r from that because now our universe is s i am looking at that metric space s so an open ball is all those points in that world which are within a distance of r from the center that we have yes. Now on the other hand what is B R S the open ball of radius r centered at s in the metric space x row looks like let us b r s will be now the set of all y in where I am looking at in this bigger universe now all those points y in x which are at a distance within a distance from R. Okay. So, when I am looking at suppose I am looking at the three space okay, of the living world and I take this subset the plane the floor. So, if I take a point on the floor and now I am looking at an open ball in the floor it is a disc, but if I now look at that point as a point in the space and I look at the open ball it is the sphere and that is what that means. When you are looking in the plane it is only those points in the plane that count which are within a distance r, but when you are looking at the bigger universe it is all those points in that bigger universe that count. Okay, so, that is what the difference. Now, therefore, what is the connection between this and that? Right? If I had taken that big ball and then cut it in the plane and I get that uh, section, which is what I call as the okay. So, the section of a sphere through the center is precisely the disk. Geometry, topology is geometry. Okay, is basically a geometrical idea. Okay, so what does this give an idea? Any open ball in S is essentially an open ball in the bigger space intersected with S, and this automatically therefore tells us any open set in S will be an intersection of an open set in the bigger space with S. Consequently. any open set in S is of S is where is an open set in the So, whenever you want something in the small space, take a corresponding thing in the big space and intersect it with S, and that portion alone is called the corresponding portion in the smaller universe. Okay. If you have, if you have the collection of all engineering graduates in India and you want to have only the, all the engineering graduates in Bangalore, just intersect that is all, you get all the engineering graduates in Bangalore, that is it. Okay. So, you want you have big universe, whenever you want a, uh, some 
logical idea in the smaller universe, take the corresponding idea in the big universe and intersect it with yes, you get that. Okay. Now, okay, anyway, I'll erase this. Since S rho is a metric space, what is meant by an open cover for S? Now look at the universe, what is meant by an open cover for S rho? It is a collection of open sets in S rho which cover S. So let us say G S is an open cover for S rho means G S is a collection of open sets in S such that their union is S. Okay. But what is meant by open set in S? All of them are simply of the form G intersection. So therefore, there is a collection of open sets whose intersection with S will cover the whole space. That is, that is, G S is a collection open sets G. Okay, let me write it like this. Okay, the collection of open sets in X row intersected with S. Therefore, G S can be written as I will simply write it notation notationally as G intersection S. This is a notation where G is a collection of open sets in X row. So, you want to get a collection of open set in S, all you have to do is take a collection of open sets in the big space and intersect it with S and we have because this is an open cover. S is equal to the union of all the G S S such that G S belongs to G S because it is an open cover, but all the G S S are of the form where G is some collection of open sets or we can say that it is just the union of all the G's G belonging to G and that intersected with S is equal to S. Okay. Now, that mean if A intersection B is A, what does that tell about A? If A intersection B is equal to A itself, then everything in A is must be in B, therefore A is a subset of B that is uh, S is contained in the union of G. So, we can say that this capital G we will call that open cover for set S in the whole space. It covers, it is not exactly equal but it may it will cover. So, what is meant by an open cover for the whole space? It is a collection of open sets whose union is exactly equal to X. Open cover for a subset means a collection of open sets whose union will certainly include S. Okay. So, therefore, this gives us the definition a collection G a collection G of open sets in X row is called 
an open cover for a subset S of X if S is contained in the union of all the G's that G belongs to G. When S is the whole space, the union is contained in this, so the two together will give you it is equal to this. So, this definition takes care of all whether it is a subset of so when it is covered it is completely encompassed when you take the union whatever you have in mind has been encompassed by these sets is that ok. Right. So, now we have this similarly a sub cover if G 1 is a sub collection of this such that S is contained in that again it is called a sub cover similarly the notion of of sub cover. Set becomes a compact subset if every cover has a open sub cover. In that notation, therefore, a subset S is compact. That's the definition. Has every open cover has a finite sub cover. Okay, so that is the fundamental idea of compactness. What, whatever you do, whatever collection of open sets you give, finite number of them are enough to take care of the set I have in mind. That is why it is called compact. You can be neatly compactly packed within a finite number of things. It is uh, not like uh, you have infinite number of suitcases and whatever you want you pack and then uh, this is less restriction like say when you get a postdoctoral fellowship or a graduate teaching assistantship in some university you go there you find that the travel agencies you cannot take more than uh, 26 inch suitcase the weight should not be 23 kgs all kinds of conditions you go better pack you do not think that you can take your books all your clothes, all your shoes, everything in fact, no, you have to dump many of these things and take the minimum thing with you. So, that is what is why you travel compact, ok. So, that is the idea of compactness, everything can be neatly packed in a finite number. Even if somebody is generous and say you have all these suitcases, you will be able to compactly pack it into finite number of them. That is what is meant by compactness, ok. So, now, Let us now take a compact metric space. So, suppose I have a compact metric space. Now, I take a sequence. Now, say I am trying to connect these notions now. So, I am going to take a sequence of elements, a sequence in this metric space. So, I am going to take a sequence in a compact metric space. When I take a sequence, I am not saying all the terms are different. I may have one, again repeating one, again repeat one, then bring two, then again put back one. So, a sequence may look like this in the real numbers also 1, 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 1, 1, 3 like that. This is also a sequence. So, I may have a see when I have a sequence, it may happen that only a finite number of them are distinct. The same thing goes on repeating or infinite number of them are distinct. So, the let us distinguish the two cases, ok. The simpler case is case 1 only finite number of them of the x n are distinct. So, 
okay let us take for example you are writing a binary sequence when you write a binary sequence how many members are distinct there at most two because 0 1 0 0 1 0 0 0 that's all you have got in your disposal so things will have to repeat so therefore you may have only a finite number a sequence in the real numbers, it may be a binary sequence in which case only a finite number of the xn's are distinct, namely 0 and 1 are the only two distinct things that are possible. So that is the case. Or you may be writing 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, where an infinite number of them are distinct. So let us take the simple case, a finite number of them distinct. Now if we have a finite number of them, and you have to fill infinite number of boxes, the terms. Somebody has to take, repeat himself, infinite number of times. This is the simple pigeonhole principle. Okay. This is the num the, there are infinite number of pigeons and they have to be packed in this finite number of boxes. Okay. So I take this first term and go and put it in that box if that term is equal to that otherwise in that box. So I have an infinite number of pigeons, I have only a finite number of pigeon holes, so one of the pigeon holes must contain infinite number of pigeons. This is a fundamental principle which all high school students probably nowadays know it because they all prepare for the math Olympiad where the first thing they teach is the fundamental principle of pigeon holes. Okay? So it is a very important concept in combinatorics. So what therefore it means is, hence in this case, one terms must repeat infinitely many times. That is, for that is, there exists a sequence of positive integers n1 less than n2 less than n3, etc., such that xn1 repeats again as xn2 repeats again as x, and so on. All these terms are the same. One term repeats infinitely often. It may not be repeating immediately. It will come as the 10th term, then again it will come as the 18th term, again come as the 24th term, again term come as the 32nd term and so on. So, but it won't because it has to come infinite number of times. Now what does that mean? If I now take this subsequence xn1, xn2, xn3, xnk, it automatically converges to that common value. Okay, so let's say x is equal to that. That x is equal to this, and therefore the subsequence x n k of x n converges. So therefore, in this case, the given sequence has a convergent subsequence. Therefore, x n has a convergent subsequence. As a convergent subsequence. Now, let us look at the second case. In the second case, not just a finite number of the things, infinite number of these elements are distinct. So, case 2, infinite number of these in terms in x n are distinct. deliberately going through this very slow because these are the ideas that must get in your mind quickly and nicely. 
forever. Now, what happens is the reverse of this will happen. That means there will be a sequence so that xn1 is not equal to xn2, xn2 is not equal to xn3, all these things are distinct. That is, there exists positive integer. such that x n j is not they are all distinct nobody is equal the infinite number of them they of different elements are okay. now i will see whether even in this case i can get a convergent subsequence the previous case given the sequence there was a convergent subsequence. I want to know whether there will be a convergent subsequence for x n. Suppose there is no convergent subsequence, what will happen? There cannot be any limit point, right? Because if there is a convergent subsequence, that limit will become a limit point, okay? So, suppose there is no limit point. That means what? Nobody in the sp in that space can be a limit point. That means everybody can be isolated. That means so take what does that what does that mean? Take any x. take any x in x now i draw a small open ball with that center as x and see how many elements of these are there if infinite number of them are there maybe that point is a limit point so i'll reduce the radius i'll reduce the radius if for every radius I get infinite number of points, what happens? That becomes a limit point, but I know it is not a limit point. So, there must be some radius where only a finite number of points will lie inside. Okay, so, therefore, there is a radius that will depend on the point x at which point I am looking, which is greater than 0 such that b r x x has only finite number of something happened here points in S points of S or uh, what shall I call it? This set yes, I will call this as yes as X N one, X N two, etc. Finite number of points of No, this I can do for every x. Take any point x, not a limit point, and therefore there must be an open ball which has only a finite number of points. Take all these open balls. What can I say about this? They are all open sets. So, this is a collection of open sets. It covers x because every point is the center of one open ball. The points of x are in that. So, G is an open cover for x. Is that clear? So, what I am doing is take a point, there is a ball. Take another point, there is a ball. Take all these balls, put them together the center of this cover the whole space. So, I have already the center itself covering the entire thing. So, G and it is an o, every open ball is an open set therefore, it is an open cover for X and this is where the compactness comes. Because it is an open cover for X and I started with X as a compact set, it must have a finite sub cover. Okay? And 
what else can I say? An open per cover for x such that B R X X has only finite number of points of S for every X in for every X this ball will have only every one of these open balls can contain only finite number of points the way we have constructed it. Is that clear? The construction is important. Every point is not a limit point. Therefore, there is an enclosure which contains only finite number of points. Take all the enclosures together they cover x and now x is op x is compact therefore there exists a finite sub cover what is meant by finite what is meant by sub cover sum of these finite means only a finite number of these ok so that means if the centers finite number of centers must be there and those finite number of corresponding radius that is there exists y1, y2, yn in x such that b r y1, y1 etc. b r y n hours x ok their union will be all that. Is that clear? these all these laddus cover the space I know there is only a finite number of laddus that will cover because it is a compact set now it is covering the whole of x and therefore it must cover this yes all is within this n balls Therefore, this S elements must be in this n balls. S has infinite number of elements, but there are only finite number of. For one of the balls must have infinite number, but the way we constructed, every ball will have only finite number. So we got a contradiction. Okay, and therefore, okay, so let me write. Therefore, S is contained. by these balls since s is infinite and we have only finite balls one of these has infinite number of s elements that is a quantity because we have constructed this ball in such a way that every one of them will have only finite number of s elements. So, all this problem come because we said that suppose that limit point. and therefore, it will have a limit point that means there will be a convergent subsequence. Therefore, yes, therefore x n has a convergent subsequence. So, what is the conclusion? Whenever you have a compact set, in that compact metric space, whatever sequence you choose, it will have to have a convergent subsequence. Every sequence in a compact metric space must have a convergent subsequence. Okay. So, conclusion uh, special all the way here. So, okay, let me write conclusion. Maybe conclusion. Fact. So, somehow or the other, it, the compactness is connected to the notion of 
sequences and convergence through this. Every compact, the moment it is compact, then whatever sequence they give you there, you are sure there is going to be at least one convergent. There may be many convergent subsequences. The whole sequence may converge, but one thing you can definitely conclude is that there must be at least one subsequence of this given sequence which converges. Okay. So, therefore, we give a name. Whenever it space has this property, in a metric, if, if a metric space is such that every sequence has a convergent subsequence, we call it sequentially compact. Okay. What we have is compact implies sequence. compact. So, definition. These are all terminologies to make life. Want to write in sequence as a convergent, will sequentially compact. So, definition. X O said to be sequentially if every subsequence, this is important, every characteristic property, wherever you go it will happen, every subsequ every sequence so, a convergent subsequence. And therefore, what we have proved is a proposition, therefore, we have our conclusion now can be written as a proposition or a theorem or a lemma or a result, let us call it as result 1. X rho compact implies x rho okay so that's one connection between this notion of open sets covers etc we had on the other hand we have sequences and convergence and so on and so forth okay so we are going to make more connections because Finally, we want to know in various ways how does a compact set look like in a metric space. So, now if I prove any property for a sequentially metric space, it will be automatically true for a compact metric space because every compact metric space is also sequentially compact because it now looks a little bit manageable there covers and all look very uh, uh, terrible which I am not used to, but now convergence and all I am very much used to. So, I brought it down to that level. So, now let us look at a sequentially compact metric space. Compact metric quickly a couple of things that will follow immediately. I am going to this with the other two notions I had completeness, total boundedness, etc. Now, I am going to connect it to that. Okay. So, now look at completeness. What is completeness? Every Cauchy sequence must have must be convergent. Okay. Right. So, I want to check that. So, I will take a Cauchy sequence. The moment I take a Cauchy sequence, this fellow will sequential compact will immediately say he must have a convergent subsequence. But if a subsequence of a Cauchy sequence converges, the whole sequence itself will converge and we are done. Okay. And immediately we get completeness. Okay. So, extend Cauchy sequence through is by sequential compactness that is our hypothesis we are assuming that x rho is sequential that 
plus since x n is Cauchy, when which Cauchy everybody is clustering. So, if some small part of it tries to go somewhere, everybody is dragged along with him. Okay. So, since x is Cauchy, the sequence x n itself converges implies so sequential compactness directly completeness of the space so compactness implies sequential compactness therefore implies completeness also the moment you have a compact metric space you can do nice limiting there no problem at all the nice thing about compact that is why we do it because all our approximation things that we do are iterative processes and then we want to make sure that the sequence converges in some form of compactness we will be working okay. all these theorems will be working in that sort of situation right the other notion I said is totally bounded but it is not totally bounded We will then ask what is meant by totally bounded, then we look at the opposite. What is meant by totally bounded? Totally bounded means whatever radius you give, there is a finite number of balls of that radius which the whole thing. And therefore, not totally bounded means I am a very good cricket player means any ball that is it for a six not a good player means there is at least one ball which I will not be able to hit for a six. So, therefore, there is at least one radius for which I will not be able to fit finite number of balls with that radius which will sweep the whole space. That means, I need an infinite number of balls. The moment I have infinite number of balls, the centers form an infinite sequence and they are all at a distance of minimum r from each other. If they are minimum at a distance r from each other, there is no any subsequence converging which will violate sequential compactness and therefore, sequential compactness will automatically force totally bounded. Okay? So, that is the second thing I will do, this is one. Two, x rho not totally bounded implies there exists r greater than 0 such that and a sequence x n in x such that uh, we are x 1 etcetera b r x k cannot cover x for any finite r for any r. That means, you need an infinite number of them to go through the whole space which implies x n is a sequence in x rho such that the distance between x n and x m is greater than or equal to r for every n and m. This construction we have gone through before, so therefore, which says that x has no convergent subsequence, because everybody like Ashtagrahas sitting in different direction, they do not want to meet each other, they do not want to come anywhere near each other. Okay. So, this particle a the force way that they are kept at a distance minimum of r from each other. So, therefore, they cannot come closer, which implies x rho cannot be sequentially compact, because there is a sequence which convergent subsequence. What have we got? Implies
So logic, not P implies not Q, therefore Q implies P. So therefore, say so the logic is and therefore sequentially compact implies both. Therefore, sequentially implies complete and totally bounded. So, that is our result too. Result 2 is X row sequentially compact implies X row is complete and totally bound. Yeah. This one. What is it? Cannot cover for any k. You are right. No finite number of them can come. Okay. So we have now we'll complete the cycle. We will say that complete and totally bounded implies compactness. Okay. So what will happen is we will say this fellow implies him. 2 will say that fellow implies him, third will say that fellow implies back compact. So, all three will become equivalent. So, compactness can be thought of as sequentially compactness or can be thought of completeness and totally bounded put together. So, that will be my third slide to just indicate. Okay, so, next we show We start with X row complete and totally bounded. So, I will just uh, show you what is happening. Okay. So, we want to show that X row is compact. immediately that will form compact. Suppose not. What is meant by compact? Every open cover must have a finite sub cover. Not compact means there is at least one open cover which will fail to have a finite sub cover. Okay. So, suppose not. There exists, this implies, there exists an open that it has no That is, it went by saying non compact. Okay. Therefore, what we will do is this total boundedness and complete, which is the hypothesis, will lead to a contradiction of this statement. That is the general, whenever you are reduction, absurd, you assume the contrary and show that the hypothesis leads to a contradiction. Okay. Now, let me just indicate that X rho is totally bounded, that is given to us. What is, total, what is meant by totally bounded? Again, for every radius, there is a finite number of open which cover the space. So, let us take the radius as 1. 
for r equal to 1, there is Now, I have this finite number of balls on the one side. On the other side, I have these open sets. Now, suppose each one of these open balls can be covered by a finite number of G fellows. This fellow requires 10, that fellow requires 12, this fellow requires 18. Finite number of fellows put together, finite number of times will give you finite number. So, all these balls will get covered by a finite number of G sets, which means the whole space will be covered by a finite number of G set. Therefore, if all these are covered, if each of these number of G sets, then X itself will be covered by finite number of G sets. That is a con contradicting star, we call this a star, because no, covered by a because I did a, a multi section not dissection, I pieced the whole space into these finite number of balls and said that you, you are having finite G set, you are having finite G sets, you are having finite G sets, then totally finite G sets, but that is not allowed. Okay. So, therefore, at least one of these balls fail to be covered by finite number of G sets, at least one of these balls, because every ball is covered by finite G set, X will be covered by finite G set. So, therefore, there exists one ball of at least one, therefore there exists at least one B radius 1 enter x 1, which is not covered by finite number of G sets. So, let me draw a picture. This open ball requires infinite number to cover it. Okay, that is what it means. Okay. Is that clear? Right. this lies in this whole space, that whole space is totally bounded. So, once a set is totally bounded, any subset is totally bounded. So, this open ball is totally bounded. Okay. This a subset which is totally bounded and therefore, this is totally bounded. See now what I did which was totally bounded, I applied some idea to it to get this ball. Now this ball is totally bounded, I applied the same idea to this to get another open ball. Now only thing is now I reduce the radius to half. This is being totally bounded, I can cover this by a finite balls. And because this cannot be covered by a finite number of G sets, one of these half balls cannot be covered by finite number of G sets. Okay. So, now this process will go on, bootstrap up.
call this as double slit. Can cover B1 X1 by finite. At least B of A. there exists, there exists at least one B is not by Right? Now you know what is going on. Inside this fellow, you cover this half ball now by what balls? Half squared balls. Then you get one half squared ball which cannot be covered by finite number of G sets. Inside that you get a half cube balls and so on and so forth. Continue this problem. Continue this process. to get B1 X1, B half X2, B half squared X3 and so on, none of which can be covered by finite number of G sets. Okay. That is the first thing that we, we have constructed these balls, we reduce the radii and made sure that they are not covered by a finite number of G sets. Right. Now, what is the distance between X1 2 is chosen X1 and X2 will be less than 1. The distance between X2 and X3 will be less than half x3 and x4 will be less than half square. We have at the distance between xn and xn plus 1 is less than 1 over 2 to the power of n minus 1. Now, there this is all we have constructed. Now, yes we get xn is a Cauchy sequence. Okay, x n to x m will be the tail end of the halves in geometric series which converts as the tail can be made small. Now, we use the hypothesis completeness which has been hiding from us all the while. We are so far used only total power. For x n converges to x. which is in because it is converged to okay the last step is the following g is an open cover what does that mean everything in x is covered therefore that little x must have been covered that means there must be one open set here which contains that point G. Right? X belongs to G. Now, G is an open set. The moment somebody is in an open set, there is a whole ball around it which will be in that open set. Okay. Therefore, since G there exists R great okay, so we have this.
No, el, yo voy a decir... things that you should remember, xn converges to x, right. Therefore, I for sufficiently large n, xn will come inside this sphere, that is for clear. And then, we are having all these balls, radius going down like 1 by 2 squared, 1 by 2 cubed, etc. So, for sufficiently large n, 1 by 2 to the n will be very much small such that if I draw the sphere of radius 1 by 2 to the n minus 1 and I get in xn, that will also be inside that ball. So, therefore, all you have to show is exists large so that take this term and that that will be contained in okay we push the x n inside first and push it deep inside so that now the small radius keeps it inside itself ok. Now, what does that mean? This whole ball is inside that is inside g that means this ball has been covered by one g set which is false none of these can be covered by finite number of g set. So, this x n to the construction expected that none of these can by finite number of G sets. Okay. So, therefore, what did we get? Suppose it is not compact, that was false. Three that we have is the following, uh, which keep repeatedly applied. Any questions? Result three. Totally bounded. Combine all this, you get the theorem the following are equivalent. Everybody is each implies the other. Throw compact to x row sequentially compact therefore is viewed in different languages once in the form of open covers once in the form of having convergent subsequences once in terms of bounded and complete So, if it depends on what is the problem that you are solving, uh, it is highly topological in nature, then probably the open cover idea will work. If you are looking at approximations, etcetera, it is the convergence that is going to work. And if it is you are looking at trying to put things inside some bounds, then it is the total boundedness that you are looking at. So, therefore, it is a, it is always means to get the same thing in different forms and, and realize that these are all the same thing. And again I repeat the same poem of Kambaramana, you should look at it. So, if somebody saw it, the topology saw it as open cover, he will always be talking about open cover. He refuses to see that it can be seen as sequential compact. It is a sequential, you are always looking at subsequences. 
but then the person who sees it as a whole is very happily converting this or that or this whichever is convenient he uses it and goes along merrily. So what you have to do is look the same weapon which can be used in three days. The same weapon as covers or sequential convergences or as boundedness. Okay. Now it is actually uh, most often we will be working with complete metric spaces. So automatically therefore the only thing that you will have to look at is this model. Looks like easier thing to look at boundedness and compact a uh, total boundedness. Whenever you are working in a complete metric space, the only thing that you have to look at for whether it is uh, compact or not is to look whether it is totally bounded. So now I have stated all these things in for a metric space. What about this for subsets? We will interpret all these things for subsets. Uh, it takes only five minutes. And then we will have a complete notion of compact sets. Okay. And uh, one of the most fundamental uh, metric space is the real line. In the real line, boundedness and total boundedness very trivial. So, therefore, dispose it up in any finite dimensional vector space, whether you live in our R1, R2, R3, etc. In all these places, the total boundedness is the same as boundedness. So, there it is very easy. The next space is that of that came across that we come across very seen in differential equations or anywhere in the space of continuous functions and we go to the continuum. Therefore, there we have to look at what is meant by total boundedness. What is meant by total boundedness in the space of continuous functions? For that therefore, we must introduce the notion of continuity in the general context of metric spaces. So therefore, in the next class, I will look at this compactness at sets of spaces, then get continuity. So before I close, I quote and quote close, um, there was a request of students whether we can have this class on Monday and Wednesday or Tuesdays and Thursdays. Okay. In response to them, I will tell that there is a problem this week because we are having class on Tuesday and Wednesday. Okay. Next week, we will have the class on Tuesday and Thursday. Again, no problem. Is there any problem? This week, I will have a class tomorrow also. And next week, we will have class on Tuesday and Thursday. After that, we will take a break okay, before the semester starts. I have to finish certain uh, travel things complete. And then again, when you come back in August first week, when the semester starts, we will uh, reorganize ourselves uh, to see where we continue and how many people are interested next level of function. So, what we would have done this time is essentially all the basic aspects in a metric space. Then we will apply to the special case of non-linear spaces, then the special case of inner product spaces and Hilbert spaces, non-linear spaces and Banach spaces and inner products and Hilbert spaces. So, two big chapters. If there is enough interest, we will continue with that when the August term starts. So, we will have a class tomorrow, we will have a class on Tuesday and Thursday next week. What I would suggest is when you all, when we finish the class on Thursday, before the first week of August, those of you interested in continuing this, please send me a mail. Okay? I will see and then talk to Professor Narahari and then see how this whole thing can be arranged. So, as of this part of the course, it will end next Thursday, and so therefore, there are three more classes, one tomorrow next week Tuesday and Thursday.